Welcome to this week's colloquium. So the great thing about Aspen is that mathematical ideas in one field um, end up showing up in other fields. And I think the this week's colloquium together with last week's, you know, bear an interesting parallel. And so last week we learned about lattice QCD and using machine learning methods to do better sampling. And this week Lucy is going to tell us about using advances in machine learning to do biological sequences. So they're totally different problems. And I guess the methodologies are in in some ways completely different, but at least you know there's Connection. So Lucy um, is in the chemistry department at the University of Cambridge and is also a research scientist at Google where she leads a team that works on A wireless keyboard yeah. behind you. Last week they used the mouse that you had behind the podium. There's a keyboard. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 That's what I have Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I understand that the system takes up everything in the room, so if you make any comments, I'm going to have a question here, which is great. Uh, I love getting real time. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Aspen is an amazing place, and I want to first start by thanking the staff of the Aspen Center for Physics for you know enabling us all to be here. It's like completely idyllic and amazing. And I don't know if anyone has looked at the house price situation happening. <laughs> like there's this vertical line over the last two years with price increases or nearly vertical line. And so it's incredible that they still managed to house us somehow um, in this wonderful place. So thank you, Amanda, uh, Paddy, Jeremy, and Faith. I really appreciate all of their hard work. So I'm going to talk about uh, machine learning for biological sequence design for therapeutic applications. I imagine this is somewhat outside the domain of many people's interest. Uh, the machine learning, quite, uh, as Michael pointed out, might have some overlap, but the domain is perhaps pretty different. If there are any people working in this area who are here this week, I would love to talk to you. So please come and say hi afterwards. But otherwise, hopefully this will be kind of a good uh, guided tour of some work in this area. Um, and I'm going to start by kind of talking about the context a little bit. So as I'm sure everyone is aware, proteins are synthesized as a linear chain of amino acids. There are 20 commonly used amino acids in nature. And so we have lots and lots and lots of sequences. We have like 3 billion sequences in the database. We have like a lot of sequence data. Um, and so proteins are, you know, perhaps the ultimate soft matter system. They have like an amazing range of abilities and we have basically no idea how they work. So if I make a bunch of changes to that sequence, it's really difficult to predict what will happen to the protein. And if I make up a random sequence of amino acids, we also, you know, typically that won't result in a functional protein, but it's not like we have a good idea of what fraction of the space of possible sequences corresponds to the functional protein, right? Like, you know, it, it's kind of all out there to be discovered. And so these, these proteins are made of sequences of 20, drawn from an alphabet of 20 amino acids, and then fold into complicated 3D structures, at least most of the time. Just for fun, some proteins are structurally disordered so that they don't fold into a single 3D structure. Um, we've heard a lot about the protein structure prediction problem um, in, you know, the re over the last couple of years. In particular, an, an approach called alpha fold from deep minds has made huge progress on this problem, which I think is really exciting. However, once we know the structure, that doesn't actually tell us the function. So we want to know what the protein does. You know, we have this beautiful 3D structure. We can kind of make guesses. But like it's not immediately clear that this 3D structure shown on the board results in a protein that glows green. Right now we know that because many people have expressed that protein in the lab and you can see that it fluoresces green. And in fact, you know, it sort of comes from jellyfish where it does a great job of fluorescing green. Right? But if you just look at that structure, making that prediction isn't immediate. So storage structure prediction doesn't actually solve the problem of getting intermediate steps, but there's still like a long way to go. 
And so our understanding of the regime type protein sequence and function is, I think, very much still in its infancy. Um, we do have a lot of data. This plot is a bit out of date. This is from November 2021. Uh, but you can see over the last you know, few decades, there's really been a rapid increase in the amount of sequence data. So the number of sequences is shown here on the y-axis, and this is a log scale. Um, and you know, sometimes it goes up more, sometimes less, but it keeps going up, essentially. And I don't think uh, that the, the end is in sight. So yeah, there's like a few billion sequences in this database at this point. Um, and that's like a really great source of data. So I like to think that like nature does endless countless experiments where it tries stuff out, it makes changes, it makes mistakes, essentially, when it you know, copies the DNA of an organism. Um, but then selection happens. So you have changes happening, and then that gives rise to phenotypic variation, variation in organisms. You get selection happening. And so we see different versions of proteins over the evolution fine scale. And we have access to this data. We have this huge repository of sequences that we know work and that end up being functional proteins. That's like positive data. We don't have that much negative data. We can't see sequences that don't work, right? Because they don't end up in the data. So we have this sort of imbalance. Um, but we do also have this revolution and be able to write DNA. So we can now synthesize in the lab exact strings of DNA and translate them, make them into proteins. We can synthesize specific protein sequences and test them actually in pretty high throughput. You can synthesize like 300,000, roughly 300,000 sequences at a time in an experiment and, and test them all and actually find out roughly whether they really work or not, depending on how good your assay is. So, yeah. What do you mean? Uh, whether they work or not? Uh, so that, that's a great question. Like, for example, that protein that fluoresces green. So I might have an assay where I measure whether different variants of a sequence still fluoresces green or not. And so I have to have, you know, some particular experimental setup to do that. Now, of course, there are many other functions, right? And so the question really depends on what you mean by, as you said, what does it mean to work? So it's going to be different in every single case. A related question. Yeah. You can synthesize one of these, but do you know all its chemical properties? Only if you can test it, right? So absolutely, it's, it's a great question. Also, mistakes get made when you synthesize. So sometimes you end up with not quite the sequence you wanted. So you have to check that as well. Um, but yeah, you have to be able to test things. So assay development is a really important project and not something that I really know anything about. Yeah, so questions throughout would be great. I didn't say this at the start. It would be really great if people ask questions. Um, I guess sort of more discussion-based questions we could do at the end, but like, I really like not to lose everybody, so I'm not clear to do that. Um, yeah, so we can test sequences, which is really exciting from a machine learning viewpoint. We really want to be able to design sequences and make them and test them, right? Um, and so, you know, we have this huge amount of data, we just need to be able to decode it. So how can we do that? So I'm going to sort of start by telling you about some work that I was involved in about a decade ago, um, that, that ended up being quite exciting and sort of relates a bit to physics, which is nice. So there's been a long-standing observation in the biological community that often you see a pair of amino acids in a protein. In this case, it's a charged pair. So there's a positive amino acid and a negative amino acid. They make a nice salt bridge in the protein, and that helps the protein fold. That, that bit my hypothesis, but you know, they're, they're there and they're making an interaction. And so often there'll be a lot of function mutants, so one of those two amino acids changes, now we have two positive charges and that doesn't work so well anymore and we don't see that in nature but what we see instead is a double mutant where there's a second mutation that rescues the original charge pairing. So it's this intense key mutation that happens at a separate site, a site that's distant in sequence but it happens to be close in structure, right? So it restores that sort of physical interaction. So when we look in the sequence database we either see the original wild type or we see the the double mutant that was functional. We never see the intermediate. So that means that we can see, you just look at the sequences, a nice correlation structure between these two columns. And of course, looking at correlations is much, much easier in data than, you know, kind of looking at uh, where amino acids are in, in protein structure. So what we'd like to be able to do is look for the correlations and be able to make hypotheses that these two positions, because they have this correlation, are close in the 3D structure. Okay. So that's like a hypothesis that's been around for a really long time. And we want to exactly as it says, exploit this correlation to make the hypothesis sort of inference about structure. And so it turns out that actually, yes, you can do that. Um, and I was lucky enough to be involved in this work literally like a decade ago. Um, and basically what we showed is that you of course have to sort of worry about uh, you know 
being able to unpack the causal correlation, if you like, from the many correlations that you see in the data. And we were fortunately able to do this. If you use a naive approach, like looking at the mutual information in, in that data, then you won't end up seeing only amino acid pairs that are close in structure. So here, what I'm showing you is a contact matter of a protein. So it's the gray shows the amino acid pairs that are close in 3D structure. The blue shows those that have high mutual information scores if we just look at the sequence data. And the red shows those that have high coevolution scores if we look at the data and fit a POTS model to that data. And so a POTS model is actually like an Eisen model, but with you know, more states, not just two states. And so in this case, you know, we have 20 states because there are 20 amino acids. Um, but essentially, it turned out to be the case that you can uh, fit that model looking at just the high scoring pairs. You identify a lot of contacts just by looking at the sequences. And then that's actually enough information to fold up the protein, right? And so literally you take this 2D information and you kind of like reconstruct it in 3D and that gives you a rough structure of the protein. And so this was like really very surprising when we did it a decade ago. It wasn't that so surprising that it got published in POS1, which is like the journal where you can publish things after everyone else has told you they basically don't believe you. Um, and so, so like, you know, this works pretty well. It's nowhere near as good as alpha four in the sense that you know the resolutions here are, are not as, as good. So here we're looking at like four angstroms resolution for a predictive structure. Alpha fold is more like two angstroms resolution, but that coevolution piece was a really core cool part of alpha fold. So it's been put in there. This is unsupervised prediction, and they're doing supervised prediction, and it's amazing that this works so well. But the point I'm trying to make here is that applying sort of machine learning or um, well, whatever you want to sort of model fitting approaches to this data really has a lot of potential to work really well with the structured prediction. And what I'm trying to ask now is can we go beyond that and get to function? These are a couple of predictions that we made that were then verified um, in the following years, which was exciting. Um, but you know, I really think that there's a, a further challenge. We want to be able to walk through sequence code and really design new proteins and discover proteins that already exist in nature where we don't understand their function. And like Amazingly, there are a lot of proteins that exist and we have no idea what they do. So I've told you there's like 3 billion sequences in the database. At least 30% of those sequences are completely uncharacterized. We have no idea what they do. So they could be like incredible, you know, proteins that produce incredible drugs that you know, can cure disease. They could be proteins that we can use to build new materials. They could have all sorts of functions and we just don't know what they do. So there's like a, a, a big problem here that needs to be solved. Um, and so I'm excited about using machine learning in order to really understand what those natural protein sequences do, be able to reduce data collection requirements for experiments because collecting data is really expensive in biology. The more we can do with computers, the better. Be able to transfer models and learnings between proteins so that we can do zero shot design. That wouldn't it be great if we can just design new sequences without having to like, you know, do lots of experiments first to train models. And so sort of overall learn sequence representations or embeddings, but the proximity tells us something about functional activity. This gets back to that original great question, like what is function? Function is like very much in the eye of the beholder. It's different to every protein. And so this is not a well-posed question. So it would be great if we can do this. So I'm really interested eventually in figuring out this sort of active learning loop where we're able to synthesize some design sequence variants, test them in the lab, use that data to sort of build and fine tune a model where we're working in some representation of sequences, really efficient yet encodes all the important information, and then optimize that model and select the most informative next sequences to test. Right? So I want to be able to like, you know, write new stories with amino acids for one of the better traits. That's sort of the, the, the long-term goal, and I'm going to tell you a few stories that we've found along the way so far. So there's sort of three parts to this talk. We'll first talk about using deep learn models in order to learn embeddings and annotate for instance, really accurately. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can do optimization of the models that we build in sort of discrete space so that is a little bit tricky. And then I'll talk about the sort of experimental validation, which is where we ask for that any of this stuff actually work once we get into the lab. So this is a nature paper from 2018. Um, it makes the point that one third of all protein coding genes from bacterial genomes can't be annotated with function. And these people did an amazing job. This was like a tour de force study of experimentally characterizing something like 12,000 protein coding genes. There was like a huge amount of work. So doing this experimentally is not right. You have like 
lots and lots of proteins to annotate, and it's just not going to work. We want to know, can we do this computationally? We first set this up as a classification problem. This is how this has been viewed in the field for a really long time, and it's very valuable. So essentially, we have a protein sequence, and we want to classify it into one of the existing protein families. The protein family database is called PFAM, uh, and essentially, we build PFAM by taking a set of seed families. And so this is sort of a small set of really carefully curated proteins. Um, there's 17 or 18,000 families. So you know, there's like maybe sort of between five and a thousand examples from each family. So it's pretty small. And this is you know, the sort of gold standard data, I would say. And then we train the hidden Markov models on that data and use them to annotate lots of other sequences, kind of pull in the rest of the they don't you know, millions of databases and you know, millions of sequences in a full version. And so we wanted to take the seed data and work with that because it was well annotated and in machine learning having good data is really valuable. Um, it's a little bit tricky because you have a very big uh, spread of sequence lengths and a class sizes. And there's like 18,000 classes and you know only one in a 1.3 or 1.4 million examples. So it's not really big data. Um, but it turns out you can do a pretty good job of this with a machine learning model called a ResNet. So this is a residual network. It has like a whole bunch of convolutional layers. So the way these models work is, you know, you put your data in, it's amino acid sequences, you learn a representation, which here is called, I just put a convolutional layer, so there's like lots and lots and lots of layers inside that. So you're just busy learning a representation. And so then you end up with this representation of each sequence, which is a fixed length vector. And so then you can like look around in that embedding space and ask like this different sequences Four, and then you use that embedding space in order to classify sequences into them. You use your trained data to like learn that classification. This is like really very simple. And so it turns out you can do really well with that. Um, in particular, we made this ensemble, Proc M, which is like an ensemble of these neural networks. And our model makes very, very few errors compared to hidden Markov model, which makes maybe 10 times as many errors. And so we were very excited about that. It seems like, you know, this is error rate on the y-axis. We can reduce the error rate even when we're really far away from the training data. So the models extrapolate really well. Is that a question? Oh, that's a question. So what about um, actually trying to cluster the data to see whether you have other kinds of clusters that you, you're not yeah. aware of? Um, that's a great question. So we did a bunch of work kind of clustering in that learned embedding space. And indeed, we can use that embedding space to, to identify and annotate new families which is kind of exciting. Um, we want to be able to do more with that embedding space, but we haven't done it yet. But I think, yeah, there's a lot of, once you have this nice learned representation, you can really do a lot um, with, with, with that feature. Um, so we also, you know, the field is really um, worried that we might just be sort of borrowing information from the training data. So we made a cluster split of the data where every single test example is, you know, at most 25% identical to any training example. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do all this sort of like worrying about are you bleeding information from your training data to your test data? Um, and so even on the clustered data set, our, our, our methods performed, outperformed everything else, which is really great. Um, this is a much harder task. And you can see that our, our model is doing better, but you know it's not doing 10 times better. So there's still space, I think, for us to improve. Um, what was interesting though is that our model is really learning something different than existing models. So we take two existing models, in this case the hidden Markov model and blast and ensemble them. It doesn't make any difference, you just do as well as, as, as the best of the two. Whereas when we take a deep learning model and I'll sample it with the existing model, you get a bump in performance. So the, the, the sum of the two is, is you know, better than either of the existing pieces, but still you're really learning something different. So I think that, that is exciting. Um, and so we were able to actually increase the database size by uh, a significant fraction in about a decade's progress. Um, so we're keen to keep working with them to annotate more and more. Um, we then went on and asked, you know, can we pre-train language models across all of this data and you know use that kind of architecture instead? And so here you pre-training, you pre-train using self-supervision. So we have a whole lot of protein sequences, and we just delete out some of the letters and train the model to predict them back. So it's a really clever approach, right? Because we, we don't have labels for all these sequences, so you know we have many, many unlabeled sequences, but here we can still use them as train data. And then we take that training model and we freeze all the weight and do to sort of retrain it on the classification chart, retrain the very top of the model. Um, so that's like a, a, a different architecture, a different approach. Um, it turns out that when we do that, essentially, this is um, 
these are all the different um, transform we call it prop tnn it's a transformer all the different sort of variants that we trained and if we ensemble a few of them then we do better on our hard clustered task than we could with our ensemble or web um, i'll show you that comparison maybe on the next slide um, so here in purple now i'm showing accuracy so i've turned it upside down which is really confusing sorry about that but in purple is our transformer network and you can see it's doing a little bit better than the ensemble of cnn um, I think this is just one transformer. If we ensemble a few of them, they do even better. But you can see the HMM is actually like you know beating us slightly in some of these bins. So um, yeah, that, that that model is pretty powerful. One thing that really surprised me, and you can't quite see, is that the HMM has a really large number of parameters. So yeah, everyone talks about these deep learning models being very heavy and expensive to train. But our transformer had 100 million parameters, and the HMM, the set of HMM and has 194 million parameters. So it's actually, you know actually cheaper in some sense to, 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 to um, at least to do inference with this transformer. Training part, I think, is still quite good. Just ask another question. Yeah, so yeah, in, your, in your ensemble of models, in, in what way did each element of the ensemble differ? What, what, what was different between the different? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so essentially, uh, I mean, they're making different predictions. Um, both among the, the ensemble of, you know, the ensemble of several copies of the same model. Yeah, they, they only differ in the sense that they are, have a different random initialization of parameters. So every time you train a model, you start from a random starting point, and you know your your, your model for those gradient descent kind of moves downhill. So, so they're, they're all the same architecture, yeah. but just different points in the parameter space of the of the model. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that, but then you know once we start on something across model types, then we're we're also yeah gaining. But it's amazing just by training different ver versions of the same model, um, you, you gain information essentially because they. They end up in different places. And so um, we then took this a little bit further by being able to annotate every single amino acid in every sequence. And so that means we're able to kind of attribute exactly where in the sequence is causing the annotation to occur. And that was sort of a step that we needed in order to um, work with EBI to release annotations for one and a half billion proteins, which we did last month. Um, this included something like 200 million proteins. That couldn't be annotated using their existing um, approaches. And these are some silly gifts that one of my colleagues made um, that tried to sort of convey uh, how many. I don't know, they're a bit silly, sorry. But um, some people, I, I can't make these gifts because people are better than me. But finally, we want to ask you know, can models actually generate protein models? I've talked a lot about CNN and all that sort of, you know, um, classify. But you know, we hear all the time about language models being able to generate text. In fact, last week you might have sort of seen in the news quite a lot of um, uh, circulation about how much these models actually know. And so we were interested, you know, can these models generate protein names just as free text descriptions? So a protein name kind of tells you what that protein does. This is an example from Uniprop, which is a database of, of, of protein. It gives you just a very loose description of what the protein does. It's a capsid protein from uh, adeno associated virus. Um, and so we wanted to ask, can we train language models to do this task? And so this is, you know, at the moment, the models are great. They'll tell you that this, this is a dog catching a frisbee. Right? And that's very useful if you're interested in the images. And what we want to do is give it an amino acid sequence and have it tell us, oh, yeah, this is a capsid protein uh, VP1 or VP2, whatever. Right? should be able to do this. I mean, you know. The problem, of course, is that I can tell you, yes, this is a dog catching a frisbee. Machine, yeah, the model did a good job. Whereas here, this is like harder. I mean, you know, if I happen, if that protein already has a name, then you know we can look it up. But if it's a new protein that we don't know what it does, the model will tell us a function, and we have to try and figure out if it's right or not. So the evaluation is more difficult than for the image case. But otherwise, it seems it seems like it should work. Um, and so, you know, 30% of these proteins in Unipot are uncharacterized. Their name is literally uncharacterized protein. Um, and it turns out that we trained a model, which is a, a T, and we kind of model called a T5 model. Um, essentially, it works by taking in prompts. So you can give it, you know, a, a sequence and ask it a question about that sequence. And it will tell you the answer in various different formats. Um, and so we, we ran this for a bunch of sequences from Unipot. And remarkably, I was totally surprised by this, it actually works pretty well. We've got the curators from Unipot to evaluate what our models were, were producing. And right now we're at 88% of the time, the model meets or exceeds the semantic content of existing annotations. So you know, we need to make this better. Um, 
but we're optimistic at the moment that we can provide annotations for something like I don't know, ten, tens of millions of projects that are currently uncharacterized um, just by using this technology. Okay. So I told you a bunch about using these deep models in order to uh, train across lots and lots of data to learn embeddings. I want to talk about this idea of developing and preparing <coughs> model-based optimization strategies. So if we're looking at a particular protein, we often want to make a few changes to the sequence in order to make it better. Perhaps we want to make it more stable, we want to make it work at a lower temperature, we're going to use it in an industrial process, so we better if it works at neutral pH, so that it didn't require harsh sort of uh, conditions in order to work, like maybe a, a catalyst that we use in industry. In fact, there was a, a nature paper the other week where uh, people were looking at PEDES, which is a pro an enzyme that breaks down PET, you know, plastic in bottles. Um, right now, those, those, those enzymes uh, don't work very well in industrial processes for a number of reasons. And they need to work at lower temperatures and so on and so forth. It's a big challenge there. So we'd like to develop methods that people can use in And so, you know, you'll have heard of direct evolution, which is kind of the current state of the art for pressure optimization. Basically, you make a bunch of changes for a starting sequence and figure out which ones work in the lab. And then you make more changes and then do more selection. So you kind of go round and round that loop. It's basically a kind of random local search and selection, the selection thrown in. And so we just like to add in modeling to this loop. Um, and so we're really just going to try and bring in the modeling piece and use it in order to navigate through sequence space and, and design new sequence. So the changes we make will be less random, they'll be designed rather than random. And it'll also be guided or directed by the models that we've built. Um, and I talked a lot about doing this in the setting space. Um, we haven't really crossed that bridge yet. We haven't done that piece. Mm -hmm. We're just doing this working in sequence space. And it's already working pretty well. And so we're, we're excited to take that next step. And so we, we use an approach called model-based optimization. So the real experiments, of course, are, are expensive. We want to be able to optimize the model, fit a model on a small amount of data, and then optimize that model um, in silica. So because we're optimizing the model in silica, we can use a bunch of expensive approaches, approaches like um, reinforcement learning or cross-entropy or evolution-based approaches. Um, we find you know, the best things according to the model, and then we put those back into the experiment. So we're only sort of testing in the lab you know, once every so many weeks, if you like. And I also talk here about um, an acquisition function. So of course, you know, our model is great where it, where it has training data, but there are many places where it knows nothing. And so we need to encourage exploration of the places where it knows nothing. And so to do that, we, we define an acquisition function that takes into account uncertainty. And um, so that we're sort of trading off between exploiting our model that we have so far and you know, fixing up the model or figuring out where the model is no good. To get the jargon, is, is, yep. is, is this um, a, a variant of Bayesian optimization or, or yeah, something else? Basically, yeah, this is a variant of Bayesian optimization. Okay. Um, and the only thing is that you know, we're working in this funny space, so it's slightly inconvenient to, to optimize. Um, and so, you know, we built a bunch of in silico benchmarking uh, tasks. <clears throat> um, the problem with these tasks is they never quite reflect reality. Like, if we could build the ideal benchmarking task and we would understand the relationship between protein sequence and function, we wouldn't have to do this in the first place, right? But they're still useful, even though these are sort of toy tasks um, that are based on real data as much as possible. And they're useful because they help us understand some of the practical constraints involved in terms of thinking about like batch size, number of rounds, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's not the real world. Um, Model-based optimization in general isn't very robust because the models have these like really vivid imaginations. As soon as they walk away from the training data, they like imagine wonderful things. They're like, oh, there's this amazing sequence. You just take 10 steps in that direction. You know, it's, it's going to be great. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that isn't really the case. So we have to kind of constrain the models to being, you know, trusting them fairly close to the training data. Um, and we can only use the model if it's, it's sort of accurate enough. So we spend a lot of time Trying to figure out, you know, how complicated can we make our model for the amount of data we have? Um, we really want our model complexity to adapt to the amount of data. Um, obviously, we acquire more data as we go through rounds of, of, of evolution or guided evolution. And so then we can make more complex models when we have more data. Um, and so, yeah, we have this sort of issue where we have to um, constrain the optimization. Um, and so we uh, came up with this. Uh, 
model-based optimization that used a sort of reinforcement learning PPO-based approach that, that can outperform existing methods um, in, in, in many, many cases. So that was exciting. And so we're showing here across there's sort of a number of tasks on each of these plots, um, a number of variants of each of these tasks. And so our red method is able to, 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 to do better than other methods in most cases. Um, and here random is shown in this brown color. You can't see, but this is what happens if you make random moves. And I'm just showing the cumulative maximum. And so you can really do quite a lot better than random um, by taking this model guided approach. Um, also, what's nice is we test many sequences in parallel, and so we can really exploit that to do a better job. Um, often when you're dealing with RL, uh, you've seen lots of, uh, probably seen lots of examples where, for example, you're optimizing, um, say, the game of Go, chess, right? And so you're playing against a computer, and so you have make moves, and after each move, you get an evaluation, right? Here it's different. We test like 10,000 sequences at a time. So it's like we're making, you know, 10,000 versions of a move at once, we only get data back kind of for that whole 10,000 at once. So it's sort of a weird situation where we have large batches um, and inconvenience in many ways. It'd be better, it'd be easier if we could test one at a time and get feedback. Um, so, but instead, you know, we, we can also exploit this in some ways. Um, we, 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 we can exploit it by uh, sort of keeping many different algorithms going, taking a kind of portfolio approach and dividing, sort of allocating different proportions of each batch to different uh, to each algorithm based on how good they are. Uh, and um, it turns out that you know, if we're sort of clever um, and, and think carefully about this problem, that we can do quite a bit better. Uh, and in fact, we can improve over our model-based optimization with what we call uh, P3BO, or population-based flat box optimization. Um, here, the large numbers are good. They rank six as best. And so we pretty much do best by taking advantage of that observation. And also we get more diverse sequences. Can you imagine the algorithms all have their own sort of biases and so they're exploring different parts of the space. And so if you kind of make a batch by taking some from each, then you, you get really nice diversity, which is particularly important uh, in this setting because often there are downstream um, constraints that we can't test experimentally in high speed work. So we have to kind of find the winners and then test them on a scale. Now I'm going to talk about some experiments which is uh, kind of, you know, whether rubber hits the road in some sense. And I'll talk about two experimental settings, one of which is designing uh, those captives that I talked about earlier, the you know, associated virus captives. The other one I'll talk about peptide design. So these are two extremes. Captives are really large objects, and peptides are really small. Kind of, you know, trying to span the range of possibilities. So the you know associated virus <clears throat> is uh, a, a Sort of vector that's used a lot in gene therapy. It has approval in both the EU and the US uh, for therapeutic use. Um, and this is the capsid of the genome associated virus. So about 25 nanometers across. It's a very complicated geometric object. It's made up of 60 monomers. Um, and those monomers all have to sort of um, assemble into an integral capsid. So it's a particularly complicated object um, it's very large it's been very difficult to simulate this uh, in any meaningful way because it's such a large complicated protein and basically to make gene therapy a reality we need to be able to modify these capsids so that they can avoid the host immune system and they can deliver the dna cargo to a specific tissue or cell type so those are two objectives that, that are important in that field and they require being able to make changes to this capsid so we need to be able to make changes and have the capsid still fold up and package its own genome. Um, and so this is a, a genome map of the genome associated virus. We're focusing on this cat gene. Um, it's about 735 amino acids. Um, this is a, a single monomer structure, which are very complicated. And then, as I say, 60 copies come together to form this viral capsid. So we want to make changes in the monomer. We actually want to change the amino acids um, and have that still work. Uh, which is which is kind of complicated. When we started this project, I thought it was insane and would never work, just to be clear. Right? This is like seemingly the most complicated place you could start trying to make changes to a protein. So I was not um, Essentially, we picked a small patch of the protein where we're going to make changes to start with as a proof of principle. So it's a small 29 amino acid patch. Um, and our collaborators can make both single changes and also multiple changes within that patch. Uh, and there's a complicated experimental protocol here 
where essentially you have a library at the start where you know how many copies of each variant are in your starting library. And then you do an experiment, you put them through a round of viral replication and you ask how many copies of each variant made it at the end. And so you want variants where the number of copies has increased at a competition between all the variants and you want to find the winners. Okay, so we're going to measure selection, um, which is the ratio of the final number of copies to the initial number of copies. That is the kind of thing that we, we measure. This is like really a very complicated experiment. And, um, we're lucky to be able to work with collaborators. And this is the piece of the capsid that we're modifying in context. So there are sort of buried parts at the start of the 29 amino acids, and then there are more surface exposed parts at the end, and it's on the interface between two monomers. So it's sort of uh, you know, making important interactions. Uh, and so if you were to design this, there are lots of things that you might think about when trying to make changes. Right? It, it doesn't seem like an easy design task. And of course, that single trial happens 60 times in the overall structure. So if we mess it up, it's going to really kind of mess up the, the, the assembly. <clears throat> um, so we started off by making all the single mutations. So there's 29 positions here, and there's 20 amino acids. And basically, the dark blue is where it breaks. So if you make any of those changes, the whole thing just falls apart, doesn't work anymore. And white is where it sort of works okay. Uh, so I'm, this is quantitative data, but I'm kind of finalizing it. And there's like a, a good reason for that, which is that actually there's a fair bit of noise in the readout for our experiments. So we had a bunch of controls, and these are the, the broken controls, and these are the viable controls, and they pretty much overlap the distribution of all the data that, that we initially tested. And so we decided that we're really only one bit of information in here. Right? Either a captive works or it doesn't work. That's really all we can tell from our readout, um, which is this, is, this is what often happens in biology, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of noise. So, um, yeah, we had we have uh, binary labels, which is fun. And so I sort of skipped over, we use this initial signal mutation data to design, using a simple additive approach, a whole library. We designed 56,000 sequence designs using this additive approach. Um, and we also tested 11,000 randomly chosen multi-units. Um, and actually, uh, the additive approach isn't so bad, it turns out. So we didn't expect it to do this well, but it turns out you can get like five mutations away and still have something like a sort of 65% success rate. But once you get to like 11 mutations away, it's becoming much more difficult and 20 mutations out, you're kind of really struggling. And just to contrast that, like in the random case, you lose viability really very quickly indeed. So even making two changes, you only have like less than 30% viability, and it quickly dies off. So it's not trivial this case, but if you know the single mutants, you can actually do a reasonable job uh, with an additive model. But we wanted to ask, can we learn better models to design multi-mutant sequences? And so we first did a sort of retrospective analysis. We train on some of this random data. Can we predict our additive, you know, like the sequences that, that, that were designed by our additive model? Um, so we're training here on just a few thousand data points that have either one or two mutations. So our training data is all close to wild type. And so we're really trying to extrapolate, we're trying to train the model near the wild type and then predict things that are further away. Um, the things are all designed to be using an additive approach, so it's kind of simple. So it turns out we can actually do a better job if we train some more complicated models on these 3,000 sequences. So I'm showing you data there for an RNN and a CNN and a simple logistic regression model also does better than the additive model. Um, but, but it does look, you know, this retrospective analysis looked promising. So we decided to design a whole bunch of sequences. We had three training sets, three different architectures, we ended up with nine models, and each model was an ensemble of, of we made an 11, 11 versions of each model, just to kind of try and reduce some of the noise. Um, we have between 3,000 and 65,000 training data points. We wanted to have some idea, how should we do this in general, right? Like, do we need 60,000 data points, or is 3,000 enough? Like, should we have a simple model, a complicated model? You can see the parameter counts are quite different from the model parts. So we were just really trying to figure out if we could get this to work. So for every model, we evaluated a ton of random sequences, found the ones the model liked the best, stratified by distance from the starting point, um, and then evolved them by sort of following the model gradient in a discrete sense. So to do this discreetly, you kind of make a lot of changes and ask which ones are more preferred. It's sort of a computationally intensive process. Um, and then we tested a lot of sequences um, that each model likes. 
So we tested something like 250,000 sequences in total. A lot of. And it turns out that indeed uh, the machine learning models, in particular complicated models, really do quite a lot better. So our analytic baseline is shown here in gray, um, random is shown in black. And you can see that the RM and CNN, even though they're only trained on 3,000 data points, they're able to really march out into sequence space. And even at 18 steps from one site, they're doing a really good job of being able to predict viable sequences. Now, this is really surprising. This is really surprising to me. Um, we only walk the models for 20 steps. The fact that it dies off out here is kind of not surprising. Um, we, we sort of didn't expect this to work. And so you know, we probably should have gone further, essentially. So we sort of built in that it, it wouldn't work that far out. Um, but, but nonetheless, we were very surprised that it, that, that it works so well. Um, and in this case, the logistic regression model didn't work well. But uh, for the median size 20 day data set, the logistic regression model actually did an incredible job and sort of marched all the way out to, to 24 or 25 mutations away from wild type, retaining almost perfect viability. So, you know, it found a ridge in sequence space and like just kind of marched along it. Um, and the reason we know that is because if we look at the diversity of the sequence designs, and we had to we sort of came up with a way of measuring like what area of sequence space should they cover, like we just were clustering how, how different are the sequences. Um, the logistic regression designs were really not diverse. So they kind of looked very similar, They're sort of a factor of 10 less diverse than the neural network ones. Um, and so you know that, that made us think that we really just found this particular sequence it liked and then like marched towards it as much as it possibly could. So that, that sort of remained true across all three training sets, although maybe for the biggest training set, the logistic regression model kind of got rescued a bit. Which was really exciting. Um, but overall, this whole approach appeared pretty robust. Like we were able to design sequences using either a small amount of data or a large amount of data. Um, and, 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 and the models were you know, quite reliable, which was um, extremely surprising. So we then went to a very different setting where we we're looking at designing small peptides that bind to uh, GPCRs that uh, occur in, in, in humans. And so it was recently reported, this I think is from 2009, that uh, a group discovered uh, a peptide that binds to both the glucagon receptor and the GLP-1 receptor, uh, and this peptide eliminates obesity in rodents. So this is you know, remarkable, like drugs against obesity are extremely um, sought after, and the fact that just by designing a single peptide that combines these two different um, GPCRs, uh, you could eliminate obesity and rodents. That, that, that was really a very surprising result. Um, uh, collaborators at AstraZeneca then took this into humans. Um, so they started by looking at rodents and non-human primates, and then they actually then put this uh, candidate, Medi 0382, into trials. Um, it's actually still <coughs> trials. trials. Um, they found that you know, they could cause profound weight loss in mice and non-human primates. Um, reduce robust glucose control uh, and uh, essentially reduce the kind of results uh, that you would like in a therapy that tackles type 2 diabetes um, and obesity. So these, these are big problems, right? And the idea that you can uh, cure these problems or address these problems with a, with a peptide is extremely exciting. And so we are, you know, can we use machine learning to uh, do an even better job at this task? So this is uh, sort of structure of the GPCR, the protein that the peptide binds to, this is the peptide itself. You can see it kind of just swapped in that, 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 that um, GPCR protein. Uh, this is our trained data that we had access to. So we were trying to target two different receptors, uh, GLT-1 and um, the nucleon receptor, GCCR. Uh, and our trained data, as you see, there are 125 data points here. Uh, many of them are negative. They don't work. They don't activate either receptor. Some of them activate just the GLP-1 receptor. A few of them activate just the glucagon receptor, and then some of them activate both receptors. And we want to be, you know, this is the ultimate thing in the yellow zone, um, but also being able to design peptides that would end up in either the blue or the green zone would be a, a, a great outcome. Um, but there, there isn't much train data, in particular for that green zone. And moreover, our sparse train data in this space is really not evenly distributed in sequence space. 
So our training set here is shown in grey. This is just a PTA, a principal component analysis. Um, the, the sort of natural starting point, the natural peptides that bind to each of those receptors are shown um, in either uh, cyan or purple. And then just to be clear, that's the natural peptide and it's uh, in single units of the natural peptide, so that's why there's a long cluster. And um, so you can see some of our trained data is near those natural sequences and some of it is sort of between them. It's not sort of that well distributed. So we took a similar approach and we trained a bunch of models on the 125 data points. 125 is a really small number, just to be clear, like this seems crazy. Uh, we actually, you know, we have two targets. And so it's sort of a, a multi task activity. We're trying to um, both fit models to each target at once, and then we're going to want to optimize the peptide designs for activity at both targets. So, this is just fitting the models. We fit a whole bunch of different models on this data. And this was a PhD student at Cambridge who did a really great job of fitting these models. And she used six fold cross validation in order to evaluate performance. And actually, all the models perform pretty well. Um, it turns out remarkably that this multitask ensemble of neural networks does a bit better than the other methods. Um, but you know, in terms of the fitting statistics, which I'll show you on the next slide, but basically all of the models do pretty well. Um, and we also were able to evaluate our model performance on a set of data from the literature, which was completely held up, collected by different people than our collaborators. And our models did pretty well on that data set too, which was encouraging. And so we sort of took the multi-task ensemble because it was doing well on both targets, whereas some of the other models could do well on one target but less well on the other target. Um, so uh, very little data, and yet somehow it's doing a reasonably good job. Uh, and so we tested, we designed five peptides for each of these sort of zones in this plot. Um, and I'm showing you the results here. So I collaborated, synthesized these peptides and tested them in a lab. And like five is a really small number. I talked to you about being able to like, you know, design really and test really large data sets. Uh, in this setting, it's still expensive to synthesize peptides. And so we, we didn't get to test very many. You can see that we completely failed with the green task. Like our green peptides didn't work at all. And this is where there was very little trade data. But for the yellow and the blue, we actually had some success. In particular, for the yellow, we have a candidate that binds or activates better than anything seen in the training set. We actually sort of extend the axis slightly um, because this particular molecule works so well. Um, and our, our designs were actually quite far in sequence from the era of the sort of starting wild type peptides and these yellow designs were either six or seven steps from one wild type peptide, 13 and 14 from the other. So it wasn't that we were sort of staying right next to the um, natural data, but this is just showing in the experiment, this is the candidate in clinical trials. This is the current um, therapeutic of choice uh, that's used. It only works against one of the receptors and they're hoping to replace that with this, this new candidate that's currently in trials. But remarkably, our machine learning design peptide actually is uh, significantly more active than the candidate in trials on, against each of the receptors. So this was, yeah, this was very surprising. Um, this therapeutic lyroglutide is worth some numbers of billions each year. Um, so the idea that you can use a machine learning model to help be able to find uh, new peptide therapeutics uh, for areas where there isn't a current, there isn't a current sort of Drug and it's particularly exciting. And so that's what we're trying to explore right now uh, in collaboration with uh, Ashley Um So I was fortunate uh, to work with like an awful lot of really great people along the way. Um, I think the take home message from this whole uh, endeavor so far is that you can make changes in protein sequence much more easily than I thought, uh, than I think most people think. You know, if you sort of take a, a structure-based approach or a physics-based approach and try making these changes, um, the models very quickly kind of fall apart. But it turns out in the real world in the lab, when you actually synthesize the sequences, they work remarkably well. So I think we could be much bolder with how we make changes in, in proteins uh, going forward. Um, and yeah. Um, oh, this is exciting. So our collaborators for the AAB work actually founded a small company called Dino Therapeutics, which now has like 100 people um, and like lots of like enormous farmers and 
So um, it turns out you can do exciting things with this kind of work, um, but I, I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So, uh, yeah. Um, great. I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for listening. You mentioned this uh, model for kind of extrapolating new proteins that kind of found this line of very similar things and kind of traversed it. Does that mean you have a strong uh, dependence on like where this thing starts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. And also just what direction your model kind of happens to go in. So I think, you know, repeating these, these things in silico many, many times will lead to, to better outcomes. And also, yeah, starting from different points. Yeah, absolutely. There's sort of a big initial condition dependent. Um, and I don't know how to understand that or you know, figure out how to make better use of it. Um, but yeah, that is absolutely it. Yeah. Uh, how do you find sixth sense if you don't know what the sixth sense is? What I mean is, yeah, yeah you're you know trying out many different uh, sequences, but among the you know billions that you have, there might be a special ones. Whose property we don't even know. Or can you compute? You said naming, and I quite didn't quite understand. The name is supposed to actually tell you what the properties are. Yeah, that that's the idea. So we are excited that we might be able to train models that can then tell us the function of a sequence where that function has never been seen before. Yeah, that's never what been measured in the lab. Um, we don't know if that is going to work. Like you know, I want to be really clear. I think this is like this is true for many of the sort of AI things that people are trying right now. You know, we sort of want to imagine that you know these models can can invent all sorts of things that don't necessarily exist, um, but we don't know you know whether they can and where to trust them. And so I think you know the questions about like attribution, sort of getting the model to tell us why it's making a particular prediction. You know, what is the basis for that prediction? What's the corroboration? Um, that that is going to be extremely important. And this is like an, a nice setting, perhaps, in which to explore some of those questions. And I think are also important in in, in other. Yes. Do you have counter examples where this classification doesn't actually return the function that you wanted to have? Yeah, so we, we do actually have, we, we've been working closely with uh, people at EBI in particular to, to identify false positives, cases where we make the prediction and it's wrong. Um, and, you know, those can be difficult to identify because a lot of, you know, a lot of times it's unverifiable. Right? But, but there are times when we know that the model is wrong, and so we're trying to, you know, then we're trying to figure out how to kind of fix it, essentially. Like developing that whole workflow is really an active area of research right now, because um, you know there's sort of a lot of human effort expended in figuring out that this is wrong, and then trying to figure out how to fix it. And so we'd love to be able to kind of do do a better job. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't talk about any of the cases where it's wrong, mainly because we don't we don't understand them well enough. Like, you know, you sort of see it being wrong, um, but, you know, just, just, just kind of, I want to be able to say something, you know, have some understanding, basically, and then that would be really interesting to present. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I'm aware there might be a question on Zoom. Yes, I do have a question, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear it. Thank you. Oh, great. <clears throat> Actually, I have two questions. Um, the, the first is you mentioned uh, early on uh, being able to generate annotations for 1.5 billion uh, proteins or in another context for another 10 million. And so the first question is, um, are, are those really meaningful? How do you assess uh, that many annotations to know if you're doing something reasonable? The second question is, um, the the audio was a little modeled. I think you mentioned uh, alpha fold early on, and I'm assuming that uh, your models implicitly learn some amount of the structure, but at lower resolution uh, than you would have via alpha fold. And I'm wondering if you could get more powerful models by folding in its predictions. I like the, the second one, but I think that's a great suggestion. Um, we are. Well, we're, we're nearly actively working on that. Like, I just need to convince people to a bit more to do it, but I think people are excited about doing that. I think it's a great suggestion. Like, AlphaFold is definitely, it predicts stuff that we don't, and we predict stuff that we actually have that like a chart of the intersection. You can kind of 
kind of do functional prediction with alpha folds by predicting the structure and then looking for a protein with the same structure, right? So you can do a search in structure space rather than sequence space. Um, and so you can, you can sort of use alpha fold for this. It's, it's, it takes a long time. Like alpha fold is not fast. It's like a thousand seconds per sequence. Whereas ours is like very, very quick. Um, so um, it takes a while, um, but we really want to be able to fold it in to the training data because I think you're totally right that it will add a rich source of information. Um, that's absolutely right. The question of, you know, these annotations, yeah, we, we annotated one and a half billion sequences, which is sort of nuts. Um, are they useful? All we can do at the moment is A, do our best to get them out there and to tell people about these annotations and to try and encourage them to use them, right? Because these are in public databases and we want to know if they're good or not. Like that, that's like the thing I want to know the most right now. We also can try and get people to test them sort of for us in the lab. Um, it's not trivial to get those people to do this because people tend to be interested in their favorite protein which they already know a lot about. And we're trying to get them to test a whole bunch of proteins that no one knows anything about. Um, but, but yeah, we're trying to make that collaboration happen. Uh, but it's a great question. You know, how do we know if we're doing anything useful? Uh, I think that's really important. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, cool. Oh, yes. Uh, how many proteins are there in the training? Um, so that really depends how we train the model. Like we want annotated proteins and we have to take the ones where, you know, we, we have labels that we really believe in. We want to avoid just training on other computational labels then we're just kind of learning those models. So that's why we had that relatively small set of like just over a million human verified labels. That's what precisely I was asking because that's a very expensive process. Yeah, exactly. You, still, you have many, one in, yeah, well, this is that enough really? It's a 0.1% or 0.01% of the... Well, I mean, this was this is a work that we found like in you know thirty years ago. Many, each, each each family has a human author. Like it's, it's a real labor of um, you know, passion, I would say, by the people at, at EBI. And so we were lucky that that already existed. We owe a lot to that. Um, the, the sort of self supervision allows us to really expand the training set. Right. So then we're not training on labels anymore, but we're training on just like looking at what. To what the sequences are like and how they're structured, um, and that that is a nice way to expand the training set. Um, but but yeah, getting training data is. Um, yes. So, I think of uh, the function of a protein is very context dependent. So it's yeah. going to do different things in different places. It seems like you're aiming for a single functional annotation, a single name for this thing. How do you think about that problem? Okay, we put this protein in a new kind of cell. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. So I would love, you know, you could imagine um, training these language models where you have conditioning. And so you can condition then on like, you know, the, the context or the, the environment, the, um, the, the organism. The, so yeah, I think there's like, this is really like the vanilla simple version in some sense. And that there's a whole, a whole much more sophisticated world. Because you're totally right. You take the same protein and you put it in a different context and it falls over or it like, you know, does something different. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have them. So maybe we should then go see for